I don't know whether sound has been stop sharing. Finish out. I don't know students, I shared the screen, you can see, right? Yes, ma'am. Are you able to see my screen? But I don't know whether computer sound was included or not because I did not see that option. I am playing the prayer. If you are not able to hear, please tell me. Prayer is not audible. It's not audible. Okay. So okay. Okay, I don't know, you know, the it is it it didn't uh, allow I I could not see the option where I can include the computer sound also because I joined through the uh, browser, you know, not from the app. So anyways, we will just uh, pray to Almighty for well-being of for all of us, for everybody. Okay, so let's get started, students. A very good morning to all of you. So let me not play the prayer because we are not able to hear anything. Okay, so get started. So should you inform me that today also is of you? Many of you are going for Yes, in the voice, man. Maybe I will speak louder. Is it fine now? It was fine, right? This is fine, right? No? Okay. I um, think I will speak. Yeah. Mama, along with your voice, there's some kind of uh, like disturbance kind of sound coming. I'm not sure what. Okay. Okay. Uh, what? I have just put on the hand. Let me put it off. That is the only other sound along with me. Okay. I think it should be fine now. Let us see if it doesn't come with any. So I will speak louder also so that you can hear. All right. So, uh, so we were discussing about you know I want to check you know whether a program is uh, uh, you know how much time does it take and what is how you know by giving an input. So we were discussing that I want to check that how does the program behave with the increasing size of the input. So all of us know that with increasing size of input, the program is going to take more amount of time, right? So one thing we discussed, we were discussing that we can test this, we will write the program. We have an algorithm, so correspondingly we write the program and we give different scenarios to the program, right? We give, uh, you know, if we, give, uh, we change the size of the input and then we find out how much time did the program take, right? So I told you uh, yesterday that we have, you know, some function calls based on which programming language we are working in. So we can put, we can check the system time before starting of the function, and we can check the time at the end of the function. So with that, what happens is uh, we uh, come to know that how much time the program has actually taken while uh, 
while running that particular function that is what we were discussing then i asked you a question that will should i do or every time like that that we have an algorithm and i want to check how much time does it take do i always have to check it uh, by writing the program so one of you answered that no we are not going to write the corresponding program for it yes so we there are techniques by which we are able to analyze the program itself right the, the algorithm itself so by, based on the algorithm we can decide we can have an idea that how much time this program is going to take right i mean not, not exactly the time but based on the input size how it is the how my program running time is going to vary right so we were discussing that there are methods like this system dot current time really this is the method in java similarly there are other methods those can be used to find the exact amount of time right so uh, so this is so so we were we were discussing a logical question that if it is necessary to implement the algorithm right if so one of you already said that no no we will not implement the algorithm to actually analyze the time okay so it is necessary to implement the algorithm if that was the case then it is going to be difficult okay and actually when you get the result results may not be indicative of the running time on other input not included in the experiment Okay. Now there are there are many things you know. In the sense, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say I have an old computer. Okay, this this old computer in the sense, uh, it uh, you know based on the processor wise. Let us say it's a it's a old processor. Okay, and now maybe this is a ten to twelve years old computer. Now the computers which you are having, that may be of they are uh, they they are new processors, right? So the processors may have more speed. right plus also you know that there is a concept of multi core right so rather than having one cpu you, you may be running your program and if the program has parallelism let us say the program is running in four cores or it is running in eight cores okay so the same program the same algorithm and let us say the same program if i run in my machine okay it it may take let us say 3 minutes but if i run it in your machine it may just take one minute it is possible right so if i try to find out the time okay so it so uh, or you know if if you are working with matlab let us say okay so that is what i have actually experienced so if if i run matlab program in my machine it takes lot of time right because it matlab uses various resources right but if i run matlab in some new machine it takes less time okay it doesn't mean that you know it doesn't mean that the program that i have written the program is same okay so what we are trying to say is whatever results we get the actual results we get they may not be indicative of you know exactly you know exactly of that program running time because how much time that program is going to take that also depends on what hardware we are using okay but if i want to compare two algorithms based on the running time let us say okay and if i want to come convert that algorithm into a program and then if i want to test i can do it only when i use the same hardware okay if i have two algorithms algorithm a and algorithm b i want to actually check that how much time algorithm a takes how much time algorithm b takes for to solve the same problem right i can do that i can convert both the algorithm into program in the same language i should convert it in the same language not one in c one in java right even you want to compare you want to compare both the the quantity which are same in every respect right you should write the program in the same programming language also you should use the same hardware same underlying hardware okay and then you can calculate the time if you have same hardware means same processor say that processor should should have same cache memory it should have same ram everything should be exactly the same right then you can actually compare two algorithms right but you know that that is the limitations of the experiment we are talking about why we do not do it okay why we do not convert every algorithm into a program first of all it is not possible you know it's very difficult it is possible but it is very very difficult it's a time consuming process that i need to convert every algorithm into a program moreover if i want to compare two algorithms okay 
then I have to use the same hardware and also the software environment. Software environment means I should convert them into same programming language, right? Because there are some constructs which will be available in a programming language which will not be available in other programming language, right? So that way the efficiency will matter how exactly the program will be ported to the hardware. Okay, so that is the limitations of experiment. So that is why we don't go for the you know the actual conversion conversion of algorithm into a program but what we do is we do a theoretical analysis right so now how do we do theoretical analysis theoretical analysis uses a high level description of algorithm okay instead of an implementation okay we write the algorithm in a particular language now if if i say what is the language of writing the algorithm okay Definitely, there is not as such, you know, there is no uh, decided language as such that, you know, it is going to be in C or it should be in this much high level or it should be it should be describing this this level of abstraction. But yes, we will have some specified thing, okay, that this is how we are going to represent a particular loop, right? Whether we will have braces or not, we do not use braces in the algorithm, right? We will use parentheses or not, right? We don't use semicolon, so that kind of a decided, you know, you can say a decided uh, sort of, you know, a writing algorithm, you know, a, a decided language is there by which we will write the algorithm. Okay, and then we are going to characterize the running time as a function of the input size that is going to be n. Okay, and we are going to take into account all possible inputs. Okay, so we will fix that the in, suppose the input size is n, and based on that input size, we will try to take care of all the possible inputs that is possible. Okay, and so what what theoretical analysis does is it allows us to evaluate the speed of an algorithm independent of the hardware software environment. When you check the when you apply when you theoretically analyze an algorithm, you do not bother that how the algorithm will be implemented. You do not bother that in which programming language this algorithm will be implemented, what will be the hardware on which this algorithm will run, whether it is a parallel hardware or it is a single single core CPU, you do not bother about all that. That is the advantage of analyzing any algorithm theoretically. Right? But we will take care of the input size, you know, what, how, what will be the performance of the algorithm based on what is the input size, right? So, so this, you know, when I say 1.1, this 1.1 is an example of chapter one, okay, section 1.1 of your textbook, okay? So this is a pseudo code, okay? To give an example, we are taking a pseudo code, okay? Because we just want to introduce how the algorithm analysis will be done. Okay, what is the uh, problem? The problem is we want to find maximum element of an array. Okay, maximum element of an array. So this is the name of the algorithm, algorithm array match A N. Okay, so we are following this uh, this culture of writing the algorithm. Okay, we will write it as algorithm array match is the name of the algorithm, and within parentheses we are writing the parameters of the algorithm. So generally, you know, when you write here, you are going to mention the input. Okay, so what, what it is, and then you are going to mention input, and you are also going to mention output. This is the convention that we are going to use. Okay, so we are saying that what is the input? We are saying array A of n integer. Okay, we have to mention this. So whenever you write an algorithm, you have to mention what are the inputs array A of an integers and what is the output? Output is maximum element of array A. Okay, so one simple algorithm is written here. Okay, there can be other way also. Okay, so what is the simple algorithm? That algorithm goes from here to here. So we are saying that, we are saying that current max becomes A to low. We are saying that, so this left arrow sign, we are saying that it's an assignment for indicating the assignment, we are using this arrow. We are saying that A0 is assigned as current max. And then what we do is, we are going to check for rest of the element, for i equal to 1 to n minus 1, right? Because A0 we have assigned to current max from i equal to 1 to n minus 1. We are checking if Ai, that is A1, 
is greater than current max if that is the case then your current max becomes ai right then your current max becomes ai and then finally your algorithm returns the current max okay now there are few things to be noted down okay what are those few things if you see we have not used the parentheses here uh, sorry we have not used the curly braces here right to say the start and end of the algorithm we have written the algorithm after for loop also we have not used the curly braces so how do we know how much portion is there inside the for loop that we will come to know by the indentation that is how we have this is a convention that when we write the algorithm by the indentation we are finding out we will find out that how much portion of the code is inside the for loop for example if you have if after that there is only one line okay and then you see this return and for has the same indentation right so this return is with the same place as the for loop so whatever rest is there that is inside the for loop. for this we write it like this do if we we do not put a curly brace here we say if this then you have to do like this okay so what exactly the algorithm is it's a, what is what do we mean by a pseudo code or an algorithm it's a high level description of an algorithm so when you say a pseudo code pseudo code becomes high level description of an algorithm so it it's writing writing your algorithm which is not exactly written into by following a particular programming language right but it is more structured than your english prose okay and it is less detailed than a program you know that is you are not saying that you know the type is in all those things you are not telling right that in between if you need a temporary variable you are not telling all those things okay and this is a preferred notation for describing the algorithm and you know the the best part with this algorithm is it is providing you some level of abstraction wherein you are not worrying how the program will be designed okay so now what what is our task okay so uh, in the, when we write the pseudo code or when we write the algorithm we will be using some control flow statement also okay so this is the convention that we are going to follow so in control flow if you have if else okay so like this we are going to write if then okay if then do this else this okay if you have while you are going to use while this do this you repeat until this okay repeat until you will not get these things in in a programming language in your c programming language you will not have something like repeat until okay so these are your pseudo code convention or your algorithm writing convention okay so you will say repeat until for this do this okay so you you must be seeing when you write algorithm with for you are using do with if you are using then okay that is a convention with for you are using do with while you are using do and then with repeat you are using until with if you are using then okay and indentation replaces the braces okay and whenever you want to declare a method method declaration happens like this okay you are saying algorithm method ask and then you write various arguments here this is how you did the algorithm array math Okay, you find so this is basically a method, right? Algorithm array matrix. It's a it's a method to find the maximum array of an element. So that is how you mention. So every method is kind of an algorithm. It's not a program, right? It's not a program that is going to have various methods. It's just an algorithm, right? So this algorithm has algorithm, and then you write the name of the method, and you also write the argument, and then you say input, and then you say the output. okay this is important for method declaration but when you want to call a method you call the method like this corresponding to a variable if you are calling a method you will say variable dot where dot the method and for writing a return value you say return expression return expression so that is what you have done here return current max expression can be anything expression can be an integer expression can be anything that you want expression is anything you know it can be a string it can be an integer it can be any variable basically it can be an object also that you have created inside your algorithm any variable you can say okay so then you have expressions so like this you know equal sign that is the assignment is replaced with this this left this 
towards the left uh, uh, this arrow okay so this is you know this equal in java you know that equal in java or in c that is assignment or any other language we have replaced with this left hand side arrow okay and for doing equality testing okay this equal sign will be used this won't be treated as an assignment when you write the algorithm this equal sign will be treated as equality operator in java or equality operator in c or equality operator in c++ that is double equal okay so whenever you do equality testing double equal you are going to use only single equal when you write the algorithm because for assignment you have this left arrow okay so the single equal is going to represent the comparison you can say equality testing operator okay so please remember this you know this is how we will be whenever we see an algorithm this is what we will mean by the equal sign that we are testing the equality operator okay and you know l square superscripts and other mathematical formats are allowed so when we write an algorithm or a pseudo code we can write n square or something it is allowed n square n cube n to the power of something is allowed when we write the pseudo code okay and then we also have the random access model okay what is the meaning of random model we need you know where we trying to learn that so we have to do is we have understood that we want to analyze the algorithm why we want to analyze the algorithm we basically want to see how the algorithm will perform with uh, with with changing the size of the input that is what is the the objective of the whole code right we are doing the algorithm analysis we want to analyze the algorithm so what we are learning in today's class is we are first learning that how how do we how do we understand the algorithm okay so that for that we have to understand that what convention we are using for writing the algorithm okay so if i get an algorithm i want to analyze that algorithm i must first understand that this equal means it's an equality operator if this left hand side arrow means it's assignment right i want to understand the use in writing our algorithm once we are ready with that then we will start with how to analyze the algorithm so we are just doing the pre processing part okay that how we are understanding the algorithm in what convention the algorithm will be written okay so that's what we learned we learned the language of the pseudo code that how to write a method and what is the meaning of various symbols when we write the algorithm okay we understood that whenever we write the algorithm we have to start it with the algorithm and the name of the method with the argument then every algorithm should have an input then it should have an output and then only you are going to write the algorithm we know that there won't be any braces but indentation is very very important okay that is what we discussed so then now why this thing why this ram model has come now suddenly right so when you see a ram model you know you must be thinking that okay ram model means you know it is something like computer architecture right that we had studied okay so yes why we are doing this is what i told you right that when you be have an algorithm we convert this algorithm to a program okay and this program will actually be running on some particular hardware right now depending on what is the programming language i am using or what is the hardware on which i am running that program the program performance may matter it will change right it will change so that is why what we are assuming here is we are assuming that for all our program for all our algorithms we are going to run them in a ram model in a random access memory model right by now in your final year all of you know what is the meaning of random access memory this is written as random access machine okay but you know the meaning of random access memory why it is called as random access right you know the answer right the answer is why do you call random access memory as random access memory because you pick up any address okay you pick up any address the 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 fetching time of that but of any address is going to be same that is why it is called as random access suppose your memory has 1024 words right 
1024 word means the memory address is going to be let us say 2 to the power of 10 right 2 to the power of 10 is 1024 right so you need 10 bits of address right so your memory address is 10 bits Okay, so starting from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all 10 bits 0 to all 10 bits as 1. Right, that is your memory address. So what we are saying is for all the 1024 addresses, right, the memory access time is going to be same. Right, you give any address, you give any address in the address bus, the time it is going to take to fetch that, but the data from that particular address is going to be same, irrespective of whether you are fetching address number 0 or you are fetching address number uh, in between something. So random access memory that has potentially unbounded bank of memory cells each of which can hold an arbitrary number or character. Okay. And memory cells are numbered and accessing any cell in memory state. We are assuming our algorithm analysis. This is our assumption that for all the algorithms, you convert them to any program. And when you actually run those programs, we assume that the underlying architecture has a CPU. It has a single CPU. Okay, such that, you know, there are potentially unbounded memory cells. Okay, that means what? That means we are not bothering that if I keep on increasing the input size, you know. Somebody can ask me a question that you are saying that the input, uh, the performance grows with the increasing size of the input, right? But somebody may have a doubt that if you keep on increasing your input size, keep on increasing, then do you have that much amount of memory? Okay, do you have that much amount of RAM that is the main memory? Do you have that much amount of memory to store, you know, almost towards infinity number of inputs? Right? That question can come up. So that is why we are assuming, okay, this, that is why we are assuming that we have a CPU and that CPU has unbounded bank of memory. We have infinite memory. We are assuming that. And such that it is a random access that I pick up any address, it takes unit amount of time. Why do we assume that? We are assuming this to make our algorithm analysis simple. Okay, we have to have some assumptions. We want to analyze the algorithm. So when I say that I keep on increasing n n towards infinity. So nobody should, so I am assuming that it is possible and reaching towards infinity is possible because I have enough memory. That is what we are assuming. Okay, to make our algorithm analysis simple and same for all the algorithms. Okay, so we are assuming that we have potentially unbounded bank of memory cells. Okay, such that each memory cell is able to hold any arbitrary number of or character. It is not like that this memory cell can hold only character it can hold only integer nothing like that that means uh, for you know for assigning input to my program there is no no bound okay i have everything i have the capability to increase the size of my input okay so it doesn't depend on what so what we are trying to say is we are not depending on the particular computer architecture that is underlying okay that is what we mean to say so these are the basic assumptions for doing our analysis of, of algorithm. Okay. Now we talk about, so that is what we have, we have discussed. So we are assuming that we have a hardware that is able to support any kind of algorithm that I am going to write. Okay. And even if I increase the input size, it does not matter. Okay. So then we talk about the primitive are the primitive operations. Now you, you know, you already know that for analyzing my algorithm, now how do I how do I analyze the algorithm? Right? So basically I find out that these many number of operations are done by my algorithm. Right? So for example, it does uh, two additions, it does ten multiplication, or you know, it does these many assignments, it does these many comparisons, okay, it does these many array access. Right? So all these are called as primitive operations. 
Okay, so basically, I find out that these are the basic operations done in my program, and each operation is going to take this much of time. Okay, so basically, what happens? Basically, I can always assume. Yes. Uh, ma'am, are you changing the slides, ma'am? No, no. Right now, I am in primitive operation. Ah, uh, ma'am, we are still seeing the pseudo code details. Uh, that slide. We are not. Why? You did not see random access model. No, ma'am. Uh, we thought you were just explaining it. No, I am changing the slides. Why you are not? Which which slide you are in? The array map. No, ma'am. Pseudo code details. That ah, uh, if that syntax basically the pseudo codes. That algorithm array map slide number eleven is it? Twelve, ma'am. Twelve, twelve. Twelve. Okay. So what happened? So you did not see random access machine model. You did not see. Now are you able to see? It's not not no. changing. No, ma'am. Oh, what happened? Mm. Okay, let me. I closed it. Can you see now? It is closed. No, ma'am. I closed. Still the, we still see the pseudo code details. Okay. I don't know. You know, this is we are uh, now. Now it's I am. We are working from office, so these kind of things come up at times. So I unshared again. I am sharing. Okay. I am sharing again. Can you see the change? Yes, ma'am. Now team screen is. There. Yeah, now team is there. Na? So I unshared it and then again I am I share. Now you can see right. So this I was in slide number. You saw this slide, right? Slide number twelve. Yes, ma'am. Right. Now I I have given slide number thirteen. You are able to see now. Yes, ma'am. It changed. Okay. Yeah. So this is what I explained about the random access model. Okay. So we were just saying that you know we we are assuming that we have a CPU and then we have unbounded memory cell. Okay, and the assumption is that each memory cell takes the unit amount of time. To say that it takes the same amount of time. Okay, then we were talking about the primitive operations. Now I am in slide number fourteen. You can see, right? Primitive operations. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right. Okay. So basically, you know what we were saying is that we what we are trying. How do we find the algorithm? the the time taken by the algorithm if i am able to find that how many primitive operations are there suppose i am saying that there are 10 multiplication and then there are let us say four addition there are 10 assignment operate operations there are let us say five memory access five array access operation okay now if i know what is the time it take for doing one multiplication right and if i have 10 multiplication i we can find out the time taken for 10 multiplication similarly if i know how much time it takes to perform one addition right so how many additions are there i can find out this much this much time it is going to take for performing the addition similarly if you want if you have a memory access operation let let say you are accessing an array right so you need to find out that how much time it takes For a memory read operation, let us say, right? Accordingly, you are going to calculate the time taken by this program is so much, right? But you must have known, you know, we never do like that. But actually, if we do, we should do like that, isn't it? You know that memory writing takes a different time, right? Memory reading takes a different time. You have you have studied that in your computer architecture, right? So actually, when you do a memory write operation, it's a it's a more time when you do memory read. it is less than the memory write time let us say or if you say read write memory read write has a different time right reading a register is a different time 
right so or you know let us say addition may take different time multiplication may take different time but we do not calculate it going into this much of detail okay so we do not differentiate that this is a memory access operation and this is just this is just a assignment operation let us say okay so what we do is we assume that all the operations take unit amount of time all the operations take equal time for doing the algorithm analysis we we assume that that all the operations actually take the equal amount of time okay so then what is our job our job is to just find out what are the primitive operations okay what do we mean by primitive operations there are some basic operations which we call as primitive operations and we assume that each primitive operation takes unit time okay so now how to analyze the algorithm we need to basically find out that what all primitive operations are there okay so let us say what is the definition of primitive operation these are the basic computations performed by an algorithm okay for so what what exactly we mean so how do we identify what are the primitive operations primitive operations are identifiable in a pseudo code so when i write the pseudo code i will know okay this is a primitive operation okay so and the, so the 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 best part about primitive operations is they are not dependent on a programming language right so primitive operation is a feature of a pseudo code and we are able to identify them just by seeing the pseudo code okay so how exactly what exactly is my primitive operation is uh, you will realize that while doing algorithm analysis the definition is not that important okay but what we assume is assume to take a constant amount of time in the ram model so we have assumed the ram model and we assume that each primitive operation is going to take the same amount of time we will not differentiate that uh, that assignment will take more time or comparison will take more time we will assume that all primitive operations are going to take same amount of time okay what are the primitive operations there are few examples okay for example evaluating an expression is a primitive operation that is suppose you have you have a is equal to b plus c so you are evaluating an expression that is b plus c right you are doing b plus c we will call that as evaluating an expression then assigning a value to a variable that is another primitive operation so if you are saying a is equal to b plus c then you are doing an assignment of value means you are assigning value to variable a right so you have done see how how much you have done you have actually done a equal to b plus c you have done b plus c right that is one operation you have done b plus c, right that is evaluating an expression and at the same time you have done a is equal to b plus c you have done one assignment also so there are actually two operations if you say a is equal to b plus c you have done one b plus c you have evaluated the expression and also you have done one assignment a is equal to so you have basically done two primitive operations there okay then another thing is indexing into an array that is also called as a primitive operation indexing into an array means suppose i am saying ai okay so that is considered to be one operation or a5 a with a is an array and i want to access ai so indexing into an array is also called a primitive operation calling a method is called as a primitive operation and returning from a method is also called as a primitive operation okay so after having this you know this we assume that these are my primitive operations let us just try to find out the primitive operations for this algorithm by inspecting the pseudo code we can determine the maximum number of primitive operations executed by an algorithm as a function of the input size okay you all know that okay this is just for your revision okay so we are seeing this this algorithm for this algorithm this is there in the book also see so that uh, section 1.1 so if this algorithm is given to me and i want to find out the maximum number of primitive operations executed by this algorithm okay so we assume that n is the input size so how do i find find out the maximum number of primitive operations okay so let us let us quickly do let, it is it is easy let us just see see this okay you are to see slide number 15 right students 
yes are you yes. able to see slide number 15 okay so let us see how what were how many operations are happening in the first line okay a0 goes to current mein is it 2 is it 2 is correct why it is 2 it is two because there are two operations the first operation is you are accessing an array a0 okay accessing an array is considered to be one operation see you, later on i will say that you know you do not go into these much detail right that definitely i will say but let us understand you know later on but let us understand what how exactly we calculate for a small program later on definitely i will say that you need not go into this much of detail you know that this two will not matter right ultimately you know when you calculate the complexity this two does not matter but let us remember right let us revise how how exactly this are the number of operations later on we will forget it not a problem okay so there are two operations one operation is accessing this array index 0 a0 is one operation second operation is assigning the value to current max so that's why we have written two operations here Okay. Then why we wrote for i is equal to one to n minus one. Do why do we write one plus n? Because i is equal to one, and then it is going to n minus one. Okay. So why we have written here one plus n operation? So you start like this for i is equal to one, right? For i is equal to one, and then you do. See, basically, can anybody tell me why I have written one plus n here? Okay, so actually this does not matter later on, students. Why this is one plus n? You will say I can actually ignore the one. That is fine. But let us understand why this n has come. Okay, for i is equal to one to n minus one. So see how it has come. For i is equal to one. This is one assignment. That is why this one has come here. Okay, for i is equal to one, and then what do we do basically for doing this loop? For doing this for loop, you will actually do a comparison. That is not written here. That is not seen here. For i is equal to one, you will say for i equal to one to n minus one. So you have to say for i is equal to one, you are doing comparison. I is less than n minus one. I is less than n, not n minus one, because for i equal to one to n minus one, from one to n minus one, you are going to run this loop. So you will actually compare for i is equal to one. You will always compare i is less than n or not. Right. So when i is equal to one, you will check one is less than n. Right. Like that, you will you you will check n minus. So once it reaches n minus one, you will say n minus one is less than n. That will pass. Right. After that, you will increase the value. The value of n would have been it will reach n. Right. So you check whether n is less than n or not. Please try to understand, students. This is written nicely in your textbook also. Okay. So what we do? I is equal to one. So this one has come here. First assignment. And then how many number of times you will do the comparison? You will do the comparison n times. Why not n minus one time? Because you are doing i is equal to one. I is less than n. Right. So one is less than n. Two is less than n. Three is less than n. And n minus one is less than n. You will read. After that, n becomes this. You know, i becomes n. So when i becomes n, that time also you do a comparison whether n is less than n or not. I is less than n or not, right? So you actually do the comparison n times. Okay, so that is why it is one plus n operation will happen here. So that comparison operation that is not true, but that because of that this n has come. Okay, so we will later we will forget, but let us know the basics and then we will forget that. Okay, I don't want to consider the constant value. Fine, but this is the primitive operation is going to be one plus n. Then why this line? If a i is greater than current max, if a i is greater than current max, so how many number of times this comparison will happen? Right. So a i is greater than current max, it will happen n minus one time. You will have to compare it every time, right? A i is greater than current max. I is equal to one to n minus one. It will go. Right, so n minus one number of time you are going to do the comparison. Right, so you also suppose you you have i is equal to so a zero is given there, then one to n minus one. So this for loop will run n minus one time. Right, 
So this comparison, if a i is greater than current max, will happen n minus one. But then why did you write this two into n minus one? Who Ma will tell index, me why I have written uh, here two? Hmm? Why? From the indexing and uh, the relate relational very operator. Very good. Very good. Yes. 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 So because there are two operations involved. AI, you are taking this as one operation and comparison as another operation. So two operations and this line will be executed two into n minus one times. And now this particular line, current mass AI becomes current mass, right? This may happen or may not happen, right? If so, we assume the scenario that my the array that is given to me is already is the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario means the array is given in the increasing order. Array is already sorted in increasing order. Such so, and I want to find out the array max. So every time I will have to execute this operation. So every time the current max AI will be greater than the current max. So every time you will have to run this operation. So in the worst case, it will take two n minus one time. Okay, this is we are writing for the worst case. So worst case is when my array is already sorted. So every time this is going to happen that AI will be assigned to current max. So again, this will work. So again, with the same reason, indexing and assignment two n minus one, and then incrementing i. Why incrementing counter i? Why we have written here two? Anybody will tell me. Incrementing counter i will also become n minus one times, right? But why this two? Why multiplied by two? So incrementing counter is not shown here, right? Because in the for loop itself, we have to consider that. In the for loop, we consider i is equal to one. And the comparison, right? I is less than n, so for that we have written one plus n here. But i plus plus also happens in for loop, right? So that that is what we have just written in the bracket just to tell you that we are doing the counter. Why we have written here two into n minus one? Incrementing counter. Plus one and uh, uh, equal to. Like yes, very good, very good. Because yes, because it is like i is equal to i plus plus. That is i is equal to. I, one is you are adding one and then you are assigning. and then return current max is one operation. Now if you add all of them, you get the answer as seven n minus two. Okay, students, sorry, it is nine twenty five. We will wind up here. The, the class is still yeah. It should be till nine twenty only, no students. We students will continue this in the next uh, next week. Okay, so you can calculate the total. Total will be seven and minus two. So we'll continue with this student. We will see the best case scenario as well. All right. Uh, sorry, I did not see the time. Uh, thank you, students. Yes. We'll continue next class. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So I don't know whether it yet. I got it because I didn't understand. Thank you.